Well, today uh, we have a uh, opportunity to immerse ourselves in the mystery of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, of course, uh, through the fruits and gifts that he and she bestow on us so abundantly, is especially our guide in the centering prayer practice and accompanying practice to bring its effects into daily life. Perhaps the most fascinating realization that we hopefully might come to today is a renewed awareness of the presence of the Holy Spirit within us. A presence that is silent for most of the time, but nonetheless inviting our sensitivity to the delicate inspiration that take over more and more of our life and transform them from a mere expression of our various battles with the false self to a more and more integrated expression or manifestation of the infinite tenderness of the Father. The gifts are really habitual dispositions. You've got them. Why don't they function more prominently in everyday life? It's because the gifts of the Spirit are intimately connected with charity, with the love of God, with the growth of charity within us not only through the love of God, but its manifestations in, our, in the way that we relate to other people. And as charity grows stronger, all the gifts become more and more in evidence. The gifts are like the fingers of a child's hand. They're not much good for anything except maybe to reach out and touch your nose when the baby is young. But give a little time and the development of all the other faculties. And, and these fingers grow, and they become capable of incredible skills. Just think of playing the piano, something of Rachmaninoff or, or ceramics or some artwork. These, these fingers, which are practically helpless as an infant, gradually become incredible instruments for beauty, for goodness, for tenderness, for touching. And so it is with the gifts of the Spirit. They, they're infused into our inmost being, our souls, at the moment of baptism or the desire for baptism, I suppose, so that every genuine seeker of God has them. But in addition to baptism, the whole purpose of the sacrament of confirmation, which I'm sure many of you have also received, the presence of the gifts is enormously enhanced, deepened, rooted, and activated in that sacrament. And so every time you receive the Eucharist, which is a kind of reaffirmation of all that's contained in those two fundamental sacraments of baptism and confirmation, each time the Eucharist enters into us, so does the Holy Spirit with all the gifts of the Spirit, renewing them, deepening them, deepening them, and giving us the power to act, an habitual disposition 
is, is a way of acting that is permanent, easy, and delightful. That's the nature of any habit, good or bad. You like to do it. And so the, the habit of the Holy Spirit's gifts enables us to begin to enjoy God in some degree and enjoy being like God because the gifts of what are transforming and which make us like God. And to be like God, well, what more do you want? But if you want anything more, uh, just try this first and see <laughs> if, if it isn't delightful to practice the ripe, ripe fruits of, of the gifts, which are the Beatitudes, which means, uh, literally, oh, how happy you'll be, or in some translations, congratulations, because now you can act as God does. What greater congratulations could you possibly have or deserve? Uh, let's relate this, these gifts. First of all, uh, in, 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 for, towards our, uh, in our centering prayer practice, because it's there that the contemplative gifts, of which there are three, knowledge, understanding, and wisdom, are most apparent. Let's look at each one for just a moment in that respect. What are you really doing when you sit down in centering prayer and open yourself and consent to God's presence and action within you. What you're doing is obviously not only opening to God, but consenting to God's activity. And God's activity is the inspiration or the work of the Holy Spirit in your particular spirit, in your particular incarnation or embodiment in this, in this world. Uh, Jesus has a uh, kind of parable or example that refers to this, and it's, it's that wonderful saying, if, who among you if, you, if your child asks you for a piece of bread, would give him a stone? In, in uh, Palestinian times, bread was often uh, designed something like a flat snow, uh, stone, somewhat like pita bread is today. Or again, he said, oh, which one of your kids, if you asked you for a fish, would give him or her a snake? Would you do that? Well, again, around the Sea of Galilee, a lot of the fish were like snakes, like eels. So, so there was a basis in the local scene for this uh, kind of parable. And Jesus' reply is, if you, as, as, uh, with your difficulties, know how to give good things to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Now, there are two ways of asking. One is, to put it into words. Give me this. Another is to be in your very attitude or disposition a living request, a hunger in one's entire being, a, a, a sort of a little bundle of desperation, asking for what you most desperately need or desire. This is what the basic attitude that we take in centering prayer really is. And so you're asking for the Holy Spirit just by 
sitting there in the disposition of consenting to God's will and action. That's your prayer. There's another intriguing place in the scripture that refers, it seems to me, to centering prayer in, in a big way, and that is uh, when Jesus said to his disciples towards the end of the Sermon on the Mount, if, uh, if you want to pray, go into your private room and pray to your Father in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Now, in those days, very few people had any room at all, let alone a private room or a closet. The ordinary people he was talking to lived in one room, places where the whole family lived. So I think we can presume that this is meant to be taken metaphorically. So what do you do when you enter your private room? You enter into your inmost heart and their prayer in, pray in secret, even from yourself. As, as, as Saint Anthony the Great is recorded as saying, the only perfect prayer is when you don't know that you're praying. Well, that's pretty secret. And so, just to back up what I've said, it, I don't ask you to believe me here, here is a little quote from Abbot Isaac, no less, who is quoted in the uh, Ninth Conference of Cashin, who visited the eastern uh, monasteries of Egypt in the fourth century, and then later translated their doctrine into the West, and it eventually became the rule of St. Benedict, and Benedictine order, and the Cistercian order, and now you. That is, a, a, the worldwide group of meditators in the spirit of Abbot Isaac. You didn't know that, did you? Well, Abbot Isaac has this delightful commentary on that text, which is really very, very important to, to, to apply to ourselves as we, as we move more uh, definitely into the centering prayer practice. He says, we need to be especially careful to follow the gospel precept, which instructs us to go into our private room. Some text translations have closet, and bolt the door so that we may pray to our Father. And this is how we do it, he says. So the centering prayer is, this is how we do that or follow that gospel precept with a few more details. We pray in our private room or closet, says he, whenever we withdraw our hearts completely from the tumult and noise of our thoughts and our worries, and when secretly and intimately we offer our prayers to the Lord. So in letting go of all our thoughts in centering prayer, we go into a kind of closet. We, we lower the curtain, so to speak, on our ordinary mental activities, such as our imagination, our memory, our thinking, our perception of sensory details, our f sense of people in the room, our sense of, of uh, physical things going on inside of us. On all those ordinary props of our psychological awareness, we simply close the shades lower the windows, or as in this analogy, we lock the door, we close the door. In fact, Jesus said, uh, according to some translations, bolt the door to emphasize how completely we let go of that whole ordinary level of conscious psychological awareness in order to open ourselves to the spiritual level of our being 
to the true self and to the divine indwelling that dwells at the root of our being and which, out of which each level of our, of our being, body, soul, and mind emerges. So we're moving to our inmost being. And we're doing it by letting go of all the thoughts. Then he says, we pray with the door shut or bolted when without opening our mouths, also our interior dialogue, which is a kind of interior mouth that's always yakking, <laughs> and in perfect silence, we offer our petitions to the one who pays no attention to words, but looks hard at our hearts. A, a, a magnificent saying. God doesn't look at our words at all, according to Abbot Eisen, but is looking at our heart. What does that mean? Our intention, much more than our attention, it's our intention that God is looking at, and that is to consent to his presence and action within us. So there's, there's a letting go of the thoughts. There's a taking up of our intention to silently offer it to God. And what is our basic petition? As I said, here I am, dear Lord, desperately in need of your Holy Spirit. Give me your Holy Spirit according as you promised. I don't know how to ask rightly, so I just sit here and allow you to pray in me, asking for what you most want to bestow, which is your own Holy Spirit with the gifts through which the Holy Spirit takes over more and more of our lives. And finally, Abbot Isaac says, we pray in secret when in our hearts alone, not in our imagination, memory, plans, sensations, and in our recollected spirits with our intentionality now directed to God's presence and our openness like little birds who are just born, opening for the worm that the mother comes. So we're just, if you've ever seen a baby bird, you'll soon see a few. Practically half of their whole body is mouth, and it's wide open. That's the attitude that we bring to centering prayer, a wide openness to receive the spirit Totally. It's in that attitude that we address God, he says, and reveal our wish only to him, and in such a way that the hospital powers themselves have no inkling of their nature. Uh, this was an idea of the early monastic fathers, that if you have a thought or an image, the demons can tell what you're thinking of or what, you, what your thought is, and they can insinuate sometimes some kind of temptation to withdraw you from the purity of your intention. Now, whether you want to accept that as a final idea, I think it has a lot to recommend it. We could also translate it into what we have called the unloading of the unconscious. And they didn't have that term in those days, so it may also refer to those thoughts that emerge from our unconscious as a result of the deep rest of centering prayer and which sometimes strike us as temptations because of their primitive character. They sometimes come from memories of early childhood that we've forgotten. Without the memories, only the primitive emotion arises. And so it feels like we're being tempted. In actual fact, we're simply invited by the Spirit to accept that feeling and let it go as a way of dealing with something that had been uh, sort of stuck or repressed in our unconscious, that by coming to consciousness, the energy is released 
Hence, now we can open more profoundly, more completely, because the free flow of grace and these natural energies is now more possible. You remember that teaching, I hope, in which I've suggested in other places that, that until the, the warehouse of the body is gradually evacuated of repressed material, undigested emotional junk, you might say, from early childhood and later in life, there, that our capacity to respond to the spirit is somewhat limited. And when, but when that is evacuated by just the process of prayer, then our, our, our bodies themselves become more cooperative in the process of, of transformation and support the movement of, of, uh, of the spirit and the gifts within us. 